On va entamer la, la, la deuxième conférence du soir. Il y en aura une encore demain soir avec Jean-Luc Marion. Et aujourd'hui, on a réuni Turin et, et New York, en somme, avec euh, Paul Bogossian, qui va être présenté. C'est un double honneur par Maurizio Ferraris. Non, là, je dirais que c'est plutôt un honneur en sens unique, c'est-à-dire je suis honoré de présenter Paul Bogossian, qui aurait pu trouver des dizaines de personnes plus honorables que moi pour euh, le présenter. Euh, il euh, comprend euh, très bien le français, mais il a décidé de parler en anglais, ce qui veut dire que je vais faire euh, la présentation en français et puis euh, la conférence de Paul sera en anglais. Comme euh, on est euh, un peu tard dans la soirée, euh, j'irai vite euh, sur les essentiels. Paul Bogossian est un des plus importants philosophes contemporains. Il enseigne la philosophie dans le département de philosophie de New York University et dont il était ou il est directeur de département. Et il était. Maintenant, il est un homme heureux qui n'est plus euh, directeur de département, mais euh, ça signifie qu'il euh, a, il a géré euh, le département de philosophie américain qui est, a été euh, considéré comme le plus important parmi les départements de philosophie américaine. Euh, pour ce qui en est de l'histoire euh, du réalisme, euh, le nom de Paul Bogossian est lié à un ouvrage qui nous a marqué tous et qui est paru en anglais en 2006, mais qui est traduit en, en, en français, par exemple, en 2010, ainsi que dans plusieurs autres langues, et qui est « Fear of Knowledge », la peur de connaître, ou mieux, la peur du savoir, comme c'est traduit en, en français, euh, qui était un euh, travail très intéressant puisque euh, ça dérive de la longue euh, consuétude que Paul Bogossian avait avec un grand anti-réaliste comme Richard Rorty, dont il était l'élève. Et euh, nous tous savons que Richard Rorty avait élaboré cette théorie fascinante d'origine pragmatiste sur la prévalence de la solidarité sur l'objectivité et de la démocratie sur la philosophie. Il disait, bon, fond, qu'est-ce qui nous importe d'avoir des, des cognitions objectives Là, c'est une euh, manie occidentale dont on peut se passer maintenant, ce qui est vraiment important pour le développement humain, pour, la, pour, la, pour le human flourishing, c'est euh, la, la solidarité euh, et la démocratie. Etc. Donc, euh, c'était euh, l'idée qu'on... Euh, euh, qu'une qu société vraiment avancée peut se passer de la vérité et, et de la réalité. Que font la réalité et la vérité sont des mythologies occidentales dépassées, périmées, il y a un certain moment de, de l'histoire de l'esprit, ce qui était aussi, euh, disons, le centre de son, de, du grand travail de Rorty, « Philosophy and the Mirror of Nature euh, ». Il se trouve pourtant que ce qui s'est passé euh, dans les, au moins dans les 20 dernières années démontre politiquement et justement dans le champ qui était euh, choisi par Rorty pour élaborer cette théorie qu'on ne peut pas se passer de la vérité et de la réalité dans le domaine politique. Euh, il est très facile de faire référence à aux élections américaines récentes et au fait qui euh, a été remarqué, euh, dont tous les journaux parlent aujourd'hui, de l'importance des post-facts pour construire, pour construire le consensus qui a déterminé l'élection de l'actuel président des, des États-Unis. Par, par ailleurs, comme l'actuel roi de, de France est peut-être chauve, mais il ne le démontre pas grâce à d'autres postiches, post-facts qui le caractérisent. Mais ce que je voulais dire, c'est très intéressant parce que 
dans, dans ce contexte, on a eu une, une preuve impressionnante de ce que peut arriver de négatif si on abandonne la, la vérité, euh, de comment l'antiréalisme est nuisible au point de vue euh, euh, politique. Euh, dans euh, euh, l'analyse que, euh, que, que Paul Bogosian menait dans « Fear of Knowledge », le point de référence était plutôt scientifique que politique, c'est-à-dire il parlait de cette attitude qui euh, s'était répandue dans le département, euh, surtout de littérature comparée, mais aussi de philosophie, de dire que, au fond, le relativisme est plus démocratique que euh, l'anti-relativisme, euh, au mieux, que le réalisme. Il se trouve pourtant que, euh, justement, euh, la chose a été euh, démentie, durement démentie, par l'expérience historique, et en plus, on pourrait réfléchir aussi sur ce ça. Je me suis demandé, lorsque euh, j'ai vu euh, la victoire électorale récente, qu'est-ce que aurait pensé Rorty euh, de ce type d'événement Et je me suis dit, il aurait été contre la solution qui s'était réalisée, c'est-à-dire il aurait été contre euh, le fait qu'on peut monté au pouvoir avec des post-facts et euh, peut-être il aurait compris mais il y avait déjà des, des indications dans ce sens dans la réflexion des dix dernières années de travail de Rorty quand il disait que au fond euh, euh, il aurait renoncé un peu à cette conclusion de euh, Philosophie and the Mirror of Nature que euh, l'épistémologiste doit se résoudre en herméneutique, c'est-à-dire doit se relativiser. Puisque il est vrai que euh, un, un point, c'est être relativiste dans l'université, avec des collègues qui ont hérité un respect pour la vérité et avec des intérêts qui sont très modestes par rapport aux intérêts généraux. Mais lorsque ce relativisme s'introduit dans un domaine mondial, ce qui peut avenir maintenant avec les, les médias et l'Internet, alors là, on voit vraiment la nécessité de la vérité pour la démocratie. À toi. Paul. Merci beaucoup pour cette présentation très gentille et très intéressante. Euh, je suis désolé que je, je ne suis pas suffisamment courageux de continuer en français. Alors je vais changer à l'anglais. Si vous êtes intéressé dans Rorty's views sur the récente élection, vous uh, devriez lire le livre uh, Achieving Our Country which is a book in political philosophy. And many people have posted on the internet a passage from that book, which was published in 1998, in which he just seems to predict the election of Trump down to the last detail. It's a quite amazing thing. If, I, if you want, I could actually get it on my phone and read it to you, <laughs> because it's, it's, it is quite extraordinary. He says, you know, The, the working classes will become extremely annoyed at the fact that there is this growing inequality of wealth and of income. And on the other hand, uh, the rich people will decide that they don't want to pay a larger and larger portion of their wealth in order to support the welfare state. And the result will be the election of a strong man who will somehow appeal to both constituencies and will enable people to tell the postmodern professors, he says, to stop telling them how to think. And it's, it's this kind of cocktail of elements that it would have been very hard to see in 1998, but he somehow saw it and predicted it. So it would be interesting to go back to that book and, uh, and to read it again. Um, but, you know, so yeah, there are so many issues to talk about, and um, 
One of the things that is one of my limitations is um, I like to be very simple and very clear, and that means that you have to talk about as few things as possible in order to talk about them as clearly as possible. So one thing, for instance, the, uh, that Maurizio mentioned, this idea that people are talking about, um, that we are in a post-truth era, post-fact, you said post-truth. Um, there, there are two ways of reading that. Of course, Rorty would have been very, very adamant that he does not want to endorse anything like that. Um, because he thought that he could defend the ideals or values of a liberal society, um, but not do it on the basis of foundations, either moral or epistemic or metaphysical, uh, but simply, I don't know how, because he just thought the conversation would go that way, and if you listened long enough, it would, it would, it would succeed. And uh, that's the kind of prag pragmatist um, promise, or the pragmatist hope. Um, but what I thought I would talk about, because we're talking about the shows on soi, I mean, that's a very, very fundamental notion in metaphysics. And um, there seems to be a renewed acceptance of this notion in contemporary European philosophy, um, especially under the label the new realism, of, and especially associated with this is Maurizio himself in Italy and Marcus Gabriel in Germany, and I hear Quentin Meassou maybe here. Um, and, you know, to me that is a very positive development um, although it's not entirely clear in what sense the new realism is new, and that's one of the things I think it would be nice to talk about. But this is always the case with very big isms, you know. They're, 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 they're very hard, they're very big words, and in the case, of, the case of the word realism is a piece of technical jargon that has been used in so many different ways that there is un inevitably a certain amount of unclarity about exactly which doctrine is meant and how it differs from other doctrines. But um, <clears throat> I do want to outline one very basic thing, a very basic doctrine that I discussed in my book, and which I would like to say a little bit more about today, um, and that lies at the foundation of the idea that there are facts to which our thought is responsible rather than the other way around. Um, so the, the question that I think is the most fundamental one and the one that Kant clearly understood but then had difficulty uh, holding on to is could there be facts about the world that are entirely independent of the language or the conceptual framework we use to describe those facts? Could there be a way things are anyway, independently of our disposition to describe them as being that way? And to me, this is one of the most important issues that goes under the, the label realism, and it's what Bernard Williams called, when, and he called a positive answer to that question, an absolute conception of reality. Now, so I've used the word fact. What do I mean by a fact? Well, in the first instance, and this is a, this is a neutral explication, a fact is the instantiation of a property by an object. Okay, so you know, when something is round, that's the property of roundness is instantiated by that object. And we think here is all of space-time, 
and there is a distribution of properties across space-time. And the question is, this distribution of properties, is there a fact about which properties are distributed in what way that is somehow not a creation of the conceptual scheme by which we describe it? This is what people had a lot of difficulty of. Kant, of course, you know, he, he said, yes, there is a thing in itself that is independent of the concepts that we bring to reality. But it is a very bare notion of a thing in itself. Um, you, you, you certainly can't know anything about it, and you can barely even refer to it. The most you can think is, there must be something that is the ground of the experiences that I'm having, that I'm synthesizing with the concepts I have. So I can just think there is a something I know not what, but that's the most that you can say. Uh, at least that provides something that's, as it were, not a construction out of human thought. Um, but of course, Kant got into trouble because when he tried to explain how the phenomenal world, the one that we are able to investigate and know about, is constructed out of concepts that we bring to bear, space, time, substance, causation, and so forth, he um, had to make some very specific claims, for instance, that one so let me back up. He, he thought some of these constructions were necessary for any conscious being. That's the famous transcendental deduction of the categories. So any conscious being and that's capable of consciousness and self-consciousness would have to impose a certain kind of structure on what was experienced for them. And so there would be a certain kind of universality to the phenomenal worlds that uh, conscious beings lived in. And the trouble, of course, he ran into is that after he said that, of course, the geometry had to be Euclidean and space and time had to be a separate dimension, well, Riemann discovered non-Euclidean geometries and eventually Einstein showed that uh, space and time were a space-time manifold rather than three dimensions and some other dimension. Uh, in the way that Kant thought. So the, 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 the point came to grief. Uh, though, of course, as we know very quickly after Kant, Hegel found it very easy to give a historicized version of this idea that, um, well, different periods and different communities in the same period might impose different sets of fundamental concepts on experience and thereby end up living in different worlds, even though in some intuitive sense, we're all part of the same world. And this idea, of course, finds itself in, in one of the most important books ever written, certainly of the 20th century, Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, in which Kuhn basically says, he says outright, look, there is a very significant sense in which pre-Newtonian and post-Newtonian scientists live in different worlds. They live in different worlds. Um, something has got to have gone wrong when you say that two people who might be in the same room with one another are living in different worlds. Okay, something has gone wrong because there is a notion of world in which they are in the same world. Okay, there is one actuality in which they are both existence. So um, the question is, can we recover this idea? Can we hold on to the idea that there are language independent facts, whether or not we know about them, whether or not we're sure that we know what they are, just that there could be facts about the distribution of properties across space-time that are not necessarily dependent on the conceptual scheme that humans have invented to talk about them. Now, um,
why is the thought that we construct the world through our concepts so tempting to philosophers when it looks as though it's going to lead to absurdity? Because, not merely for the fact that I mentioned that two people living, being, who are in the same room can be said to be living in different worlds, but because many of the facts that we talk about antedate human existence, okay? They, they were, they were, the world existed, the universe we told existed for 14 billion years and humans are a very, very recent uh, development in the history of the universe. Now if you ask yourself, how could it be that all facts about the universe owe themselves in some sense to human thought when by the very best accounts that we have of the world in which we live, many facts about the world existed before humans came on the scene. Now, when constructivists are not being very careful, or maybe especially when they want to court a certain kind of attention, they say things that sound downright nonsensical on this point. So we all know the famous example of Bruno Latour, who said when French scientists working on the mummy of Ramses II, who died 1213 BC, when they said that Ramses probably died of tuberculosis, Bruno Latour said in this famous paper, how could he die due to a bacillus discovered by Robert Koch in 1882? Latour noted that just as it would be an anachronism to say that he died of, that he died of, from machine gun fire as to say that he died of tuberculosis. So before Koch, he says, the bacillus had no real existence. And to continue this quote, I just recently looked up the paper again to see whether it really said, and it's, it's worse than I remember. He says, Koch bacilli have a local history that limits them to Berlin at the turn of the century. They may be allowed to spread all to all the years that came after 1882, provide Koch's claim is accepted as a fact and incorporated into routine practices, but they certainly can't jump back to the years before. Wonderful. Now, of course, this is, I mean, astonishing, because if you know the, anything about bacilli, well, you know that they were supposed to have been around for a very long time before humans came along, and they certainly could have been there in Ramsey's lungs and caused him to die. What's the, what, what exactly is the difficulty about this? Some confusion is taking place when you replace the question, was there an organism with a certain property which had a certain causal impact? And when did we start talking like this and then did we come to accept that this was a good explanation? Th questions about when did we come to accept it and when did we start to explain things this way may have started in 1882. But in 1882, we simply discovered how things had been all along. Not so we didn't invent the fact in 1882. We just discovered something that was there anyway. But there is some enormous difficulty, apparently, about making sense of the idea that this thing might have been there anyway prior to people having in come up with the concept of a bacillus or in discovered that particular bacillus. Now, you see, I, I have to say that you know, this kind of remark is a problem not just for constructivism, but it's a problem for the whole of philosophy. Because, as you know, increasingly, the money that is, goes into research in universities is controlled by scientists. And science is very expensive. And scientists, on the whole, and I've had a lot of experience with this. In fact, well, my first degree was in physics, so I know it from the inside, but I also have a lot of experience with senior scientists. They don't have a lot of time for philosophy, so they don't spend a lot of time thinking about it or reading about it. But when they see some especially famous philosopher, somebody who's regarded as a world figure, 
say something that they think is nonsense, well, they think, okay, these guys are all idiots, we'll cut their funding, and that's it. So it's a very, sociologically, politically, it's a very dangerous, if, you've, if, if people start being irresponsible with the way philosophy is represented in the culture at large, you know, the scientists don't have a lot of time for subtleties. You know, they'll just think, okay, uh, we need this money for some research. Let's cut these philosophers back a little bit. So, um, the question is, how did brilliant people, and I, and I, I, I include Latour among them, um, but certainly Rorty and Putnam and Goodman and, before that, uh, Kant, Hegel, Nietzsche, Heidegger. Um, how did they come to find uh, this idea so repellent, this idea of the absolute conception of reality, a conception of reality in which there could be facts that are not human constructions? Um, now, Rorty unlike Latour, was very aware of the dangers of coming close to saying that human beings made it the case that dinosaurs existed on Earth. You know, he wanted to find a way of, say, denying that there could be facts that are independent of our conceptual schemes. But he was very well aware that the last way, the last where you wanted to put that is to say that we somehow or other made it the case that these things existed before we did. So he says, and I'll quote from him, he says, people like, and he acknowledges this, people like Goodman, Putnam, and myself, people who think there is no description independent way the world is, no way it is under no description, keep being tempted to use Kantian form matter metaphors we are tempted to say that there were no objects before language shaped the raw material. A lot of ding and zichy, all content and no scheme stuff. He had a funny way with words. But as soon as we say anything like this, we find ourselves accused plausibly of making the false causal claim that the invention of the word dinosaur, the concept dinosaur, caused dinosaurs to come into existence, of being what our opponents call linguistic idealists. So the very same, the very thing that Latour seems to embrace. But he insisted that there was a different and perfectly legitimate way to make sense of this idea of fact constructivism, as I will call it. And he says, and let me quote this passage, none of us anti-representationalists, as he called himself, have ever doubted that most things in the universe are causally independent of us. What we question is whether they are representationally independent of us. And he gives an explanation of what it is to be representationally independent. For X to be representationally independent of us is for X to have an intrinsic feature such that it is better described by some of our terms rather than others. Because we can see no way of deciding which descriptions of an object get at what is intrinsic to it, as opposed to its merely relational, descriptive, relative features, we are prepared to discard the intrinsic-extrinsic distinction, the claim that beliefs represent, and the whole question of representational independence or dependence. This means, he says, discarding the idea of, as Bernard Williams has put it, how things are anyway, apart from how or whether they are described. Okay, so that's the end of that complicated passage. Let me walk you through that passage a little bit, because it moves very quickly. He wants to say, dinosaurs are not causally dependent on us. That seems right. <laughs> but they are rather representationally dependent on us. What does it mean for something to be representationally dependent on us? He says, consists in their not having any intrinsic features that would allow us to say that some of our descriptions better describe what they are 
than others of our descriptions. And Rorty goes on to say, because we can't decide which of their features are intrinsic and which are description dependent, we are prepared to discard the whole distinction. And since we are prepared to discard the whole distinction, we are prepared to discard the whole question of representational independence versus dependence. Now, you should think, wait, what, what, what just happened there? You, know, you started out saying that you doubt the thesis of representational independence. That makes it sound like you affirm representational dependence. But he ends up saying that he rejects the very question to which representational dependence would be an answer. And that all happens in that one little paragraph. Now look, strictly speaking, that's not a contradiction. You can have the view that if you were to take a certain question seriously, are they dependent or not dependent, then any answer you give to that would be one that you don't like. So you want to reject the question. That can happen. It's like Oscar Wilde when he was asked, you know, um, do you blaspheme against God? He said, blasphemy is not one of my words. It's like, I just, I, it's, not, it's not a word I, I can even use in a question, so I reject the whole question. But here lies a deep point, because you see, once you take seriously the question, could there be such a thing as reality as it is in itself that is independently of our descriptions of it? There is no option but to answer yes. Every other answer lands you in absurdity. And the reason is that there is no fancy notion of dependence, not causal or otherwise, that's going to make it sound OK to say that facts about dinosaurs depend upon us. There is no notion of dependence. That is no, he, he thinks as long as it's not causal dependence, it's fine. No, he realizes even if you say it's not causal dependence, some other kind of dependence, it's metaphysical dependence, it's supervenience, it's uh, grounds, it's whatever it is. None of that is true. None of that works. So there is no notion of dependence that's going to make that claim sound OK. That means there is no way of saying it. They are, in some sense or other, dependent on us. That means you have to reject the question. But how could there be something wrong with this question? It's a, you, know, you started out with this question, and in fact, what you wanted to say was, no, they're not independent of us. There is an important sense in which they're not independent of us. So the dilemma is this. Either you ask the question, in which case the only answer is yes, or you find some fancy way of saying that the question is incoherent and change the subject. But really that A doesn't work because I understand the question perfectly well. I understand the person perfectly well because I will give you examples of things that aren't independent of human beings. <laughs> okay, and I will come to those in a minute. Of course, all social objects, for instance, or all mental objects are not independent of human minds. So we know that question perfectly well. And we can ask it about the dinosaurs. Okay, and there is no good answer to that that's anything other than yes. So... Um, and moreover, by the way, most of the writings, when he's not worried about this problem, he is full of affirmation that we, you can't say that they are uh, totally independent of us. Now, the question is, given that this is uh, such a um, slightly blindingly compelling, I think, argument, the question is why people are, were so attracted to this view of fact constructivism. And I think, you know, there are probably many different answers to this in the case of different people, many different motivations. Kant's motivation, of course, Kant's big motivation for getting into transcendental idealism is that he thought it was essential for explaining synthetic a priori knowledge. 
Okay, that would be very, very far from Rorty's motivation, who didn't like any of those. He didn't like the analytic synthetic distinction, didn't like the a priori, a posteriori distinction. So that wouldn't have been his motivation. Part of what's going on, I think, in Rorty's case, and I think in the case of many others, is that they run together the thesis of fact constructivism or fact uh, anti-realism with another thesis that is, although I think not in the end true, much more plausible. And that is the thesis that I call the social relativity of the usefulness of descriptions. Okay, big word. And I'll quote a passage from Rorty in which he talks about this. Basically, this is the pragmatist view of knowledge or of the utility of certain ways of describing the world. So you might think, you might think, that when you want to explain why it is that people accept certain kinds of concepts and certain kinds of theories, you have to look at what their interests are, and you have to look at what their, even what their size is, for instance, you know, relative to the things that they're investigating. So he says, we describe giraffes as we do as giraffes because of our needs and interests. We speak a language which includes the word giraffe because it suits our purposes to do so. The same goes for words like organ, cell, atom, and so on. The names of the parts out of things out of which giraffes are made, so to speak. All the descriptions we give of things are suited to our purposes. The line between a giraffe and the surrounding air is clear enough if you are a human being interested in hunting for meat, but if you are a space voyager or an amoeba, uh, that line is not so clear, and it is not so clear that you would need or have a word for giraffe in your language. Okay, so you see that point? That point is it's not even just about social interest. It's about the scale. How am I doing on time? Oh, yes, you, have, uh, you still have, um, say, 10 minutes is enough. Molto general. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so the point about this is even if you, I, I, I think that isn't the correct epistemological story about why we accept certain theories or why we have certain concepts. It's not the full story, though, though sometimes our own interests and needs and scale and so on can be relevant to explaining why we are uh, interested in certain questions and also why we come to adopt certain views about the world. Um, but the main, the main point is that, you see, he routinely went from that pragmatist view about acceptance to this anti-realist view about facts. So he, he often says, after he gives this passage, he says, more generally, it's not clear that any of the millions of ways of describing the bit of space-time occupied by what he call a giraffe is closer to the way things are in and of themselves than any of the others. And the crucial point is that the fact constructivism, that fact anti-realism that he states more generally, is not in any way a generalization of what came before. They're just completely independent points. It is one thing to say that we have to explain our acceptance of certain descriptions in terms of our practical interests, rather than in terms of their correspondence to the way things are in and of themselves. And it's quite another thing to say that there is no such thing as a way things are in and of themselves, independently of our descriptions. That's just a, a major logical gap, and it's constantly being uh, elided. I mean, to see this, you see, one of the things that people often do is they think fact constructivism um, commits you to there being a single true description of any given bit of space-time. Okay. And the fact is, even on a realist view, any given bit of space-time will have potential infinity of correct descriptions because there are an infinite number of relational properties, for instance. So for instance, just to give a, a silly example, you might have the giraffe chewing on an acacia tree, uh, but that giraffe might also be a creature in Donald Trump's garden because he's got a lot of money, he can buy a giraffe, probably. So that, to say it's, a, it's an object in Donald Trump's garden and to say that it's a giraffe chewing on an acacia tree 
uh, are two perfectly correct descriptions, and then there's a, a million others or, or an infinite number of others, okay? The point is that to say that there is a fact of the matter doesn't commit you to there being only one thing that's true, <coughs> but it does commit you to not everything's being true <laughs> when said about that bit of space time. So for instance, if I take that giraffe, which is also in Donald Trump's garden, but I say of it that it's an asteroid, then that's false, you see? So, and that's just dictated by the facts and, of course, the meanings of the words. So realism does not commit you to there being one true description, but it does commit you to not everything being true all at the same time of any particular bit of uh, space-time. Um, now, so far, I've been trying to defend the idea that there could be facts about how things are that are independent of humans and their mental activities. But of course, there are also many things that couldn't exist without humans and their mental activities. What are some of those things? Well, some objects are, as we call them, social objects or social facts. And Maurizio has written about this very illuminatingly. None of those could have existed without humans and their cognitive activities. Money, marriage, clubs, restaurant, chairs, the fact that this piece of paper is valuable, the fact that this object is furniture, none of these could have existed without minds. Some people are tempted to say, you see, this is an interesting thing. Uh, John Searle, for instance, uh, who is a, a very rabid realist, he says, yeah, there is, there's clearly an intuitive sense in which social things are less real than, than dinosaurs or electrons or atoms and so on. And I think there is really no, no reason to say that. And I think this is something that you and I have discussed in the past. Um, after all, minds are real, okay, and they are trivially mind-dependent. I don't mean anything special here by mind. I heard there was some discussion of that in the previous panel. Um, for, all I, for all I care, minds could be brains or... or, or or, or an anti-reductionist view might be true, whatever. But trivially, minds couldn't exist without minds. So real can't mean mind independent, because then minds would be unreal, and that's not a, that's not a good outcome. Um, what's real is what exists. And what exists may be mind independent, the physical, for example, or it could be mental, and even social. And among the mind independent things, we don't need to make uh, invidious distinctions among the things that exist, designating some of them as somehow more real than others. And I think among some new realists, I'm not sure that you're one of them, I think there is a kind of salutary insistence on this point, which I agree with. Now, of course, there are many important controversies and puzzles about what exists. So people argue about numbers, abstract objects. Um, and for normative facts, are they mind-dependent or mind-independent? Now, I myself think that that issue, of course, about normativity, by the normative, I, of course, not, don't just mean morality, but rationality and, of course, aesthetics. Um, I believe that it is ultimately impossible to make sense of the claim that all normative facts are themselves mind dependent, but I won't talk about that now, but we'll talk about that tomorrow night at the Nuit de la Philosophie at 9.30, if you're interested. So I'll stop here. In order not to transform the, Nuit, the, the, the evening of the philosophy into the Nuit of the philosophy, uh, we have, uh, do we have uh, uh, 10 minutes, sir? Okay. Um, Sorry, did I go on for longer than? No, no, no. It was uh, it was perfect. Uh, I believe that we have uh, plenty of questions on uh, uh, this topic, uh, but uh, I have uh, just uh, uh, before giving uh, uh, the, floor. the floor, I have uh, two points uh, on uh, your. Uh, uh, presentation uh, which I obviously agree with uh, all you said. Uh, one is on the social uh, object, uh, and uh, the fact is that uh, 
The fact that social objects are social dependent, uh, which is uh, pretty obvious, does not imply that they are social constructed. There is a, there a kind of uh, uh, slightly slippery uh, um, event in, like uh, in Rort, because uh, 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 slippery slope, uh -huh. uh, I, I would say, because um, we are not the constructor of our society. We entered in our society and she was already there. And uh, we cannot uh, change the whole society, which is uh, something that we find out like uh, something already existing. Um, and this is uh, uh, a mistake that uh, is done by, by Searle, a curious uh, uh, constructivist uh, mistake uh, in sir he really believes that uh, we construct uh, uh, money uh, me and you we can agree on uh, that fact uh, that this pen is money it does does not work so there is this two different points social dependent social construct the, uh, the other the other point um, is uh, uh, you explained in an excellent way why uh, people were constructivist uh, in uh, the 20th century. Uh, one can wonder why there were constructivists uh, in the 18th century. And uh, on this I have uh, an hypothesis. The fact that uh, they were convinced that, that the world was so much young that it was really. They, uh, mostly they imagined that the world was uh, 6,000 uh, years old, so that we are not able to explain all the order given in the world, and they have to recur to some kind of construction. Imagine that was very widespread theories about uh, the divine origin of the language, because they said, well, language is so complex, we cannot imagine that it has been built out uh, by, uh, uh, by man, it was uh, built out by, uh, by uh, God. If, but if you uh, see that uh, the world is uh, uh, 14 billion years old, then you don't need uh, a kind of construction this way. There were this, the two points. The second was a commentary, uh, an addiction, uh, and the first uh, was, uh, so to speak, uh, 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 a so real the, question. The, the, just to go to start with the, the second one, you mean because people thought, but then, I don't think anybody ever thought that there weren't, there, there wasn't a world before there were humans. I mean, even on the Adam and Eve story, there's a world before there were humans. Uh, yeah, yes, 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 but uh, uh, in order to have uh, such uh, a perfect machine, mm. the argument was always uh, there we should have uh, a constructor of mm. this, uh, of such a perfect machine. And uh, Kant uh, secularized this vision, saying mm. the construction of such a perfect machine is uh, ich denke. Uh, but, um, but, you know, I mean, it would be a mistake because, uh, you know, presumably facts about God weren't constructed by God. So if you really are thinking about, if you think all that's gone is that this notion of the construction has gone secular, in the notion of a thing in itself, I think there would be a confusion in that. But about the first question, you know, you, it's, it's interesting, you have, it's an, it's an interesting question to what extent the metaphor of construction is playing a very big role in social constructionist views and to what extent mere dependence is what's going on. You're absolutely right that we can notionally make this distinction. So for instance, Suppose I think, what, what I think, this would be the wrong view of color, but, but some people have the view of color according to which colors exist because objects have a certain disposition to cause certain kinds of mental state in you, namely red appearances. Um, that would be a way in which colors are dependent on human minds, but it would seem kind of wrong to say that we construct the colors. So there is dependence without construction. What happens, what is the real meat of construction? 
The idea is, presumably, that there is some kind of intentional activity involved in bringing about the thing or in maintaining it. And there, I think, uh, you know, it's not so implausible to say that we construct societies because it does involve intentional activity on our parts to either belong or to maintain or, for instance, to keep the institution of currency going requires the intentional activity and agreement of a lot of people. Uh, and in that sense, you see, that's different from the, from the mere dependence case of colors, which, which just show up, you know, and they depend on you, but, but you're not doing anything actively to maintain hmm. them. So I think ma money, marriage, society, clubs, restaurants, groups, all of these things, there is a way in which you can make sense of the idea that that uh, construction is going on. Construction doesn't have to mean that you created it ex nihilo from your intentional activity. Of course, you know, for instance, I mean, language, I suppose you could th think, uh, common language is a social construction, but we're, we're born into it, we acquire it. Uh, nevertheless, the point about construction, I think, can remain. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so there is a question, question here. Behind the Bruno Latour critique, and maybe all Viveiros de Castro, uh, sadly he's not here, I try to make some questions in this direction. Uh, behind him, Gibbs, behind Bruno Latour, on this uh, worldview, gives a lot from another societies that they are not European societies. Behind Bruno Latter is this experience of ethnology, or we can say all the think uh, that were Levi Strauss and Le Pensier Sauvage and, and the Savage Mind uh, writing. And all, when you think about this, when you think uh, how, for example, the think from Heidegger have some resonance in Japan that's from more strong that in Europe, and Japan was really an industrial uh, country, but we have all seven or the eight translations from Zainon's side. Seven or eight? Seven, seven uh, different translations from, from Ben and Time. And I think they have a resonance in the lot. I think there is the, the farm that Bruno Latin Viveiro de Castro would he uh, uh, defend. On more concrete, uh, to make a question, yes. in your world, um, can contradictions be true? Like Graham Priest in his uh, theory on, I, I talk about paraconsistent logic. Yeah. On, I think there because all the argumentation that uh, you all know suppose this Aristotelian logic. You don't want to, to buy contradictions. You, you try to, to say the things how they are. Now, we try this all, we try to say the things how they are, but can contradictions in your world be true or not? No. No. And uh, you know, even, Graham, even on Graham Priest's view, it would be very, very special cases which he thinks there could be true contradictions. And it's one of the great, you know, it's, it is one of the great th things about philosophy is that uh, there's, there's nearly no view that's so far out that somebody hasn't tried to defend it. But, and I say, you know, in Graham's case, you know, he's, um, there have been some ingenious ideas, but uh, they are, supposedly very, very special cases that wouldn't in general explain the kinds of uh, contradictions to which a constructivist view would be committed. And secondly, I don't even buy his, so, but, but I, I mean, you know, we know from Aristotle, you see, we realized uh, that uh, the law of non-contradiction is just kind of rock bottom. It's very hard to think of an argument for it that wouldn't be much more controversial than the principle itself. So it's one of those cases where you're just at rock bottom. Uh, Paul, uh, simple question of understanding. I didn't understand if the realism that you are defending implies or excluded 
uh, the reality of natural kinds. Ah. Because you spoke of giraffe. Yes. Do giraffe exist by themselves? Uh, you know, I mean, the Francis, kind. Francis has a wonderful way of uh, putting his finger on a crucial a missing element. Actually, one passage I skipped right at the very start, partly because I kind of started to talk about Rorty and Trump and so on, was to make a distinction, a very important distinction, between the question of realism as it is asked about the bare existence of facts and so of the distribution of properties across space-time, no matter which properties we may be talking about, versus the question of whether some of these properties are more natural than others. Okay. Now this is something, so it's a very, very important distinction. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, this is a, a question on which recent analytic philosophy has paid a lot of attention. It's a very interesting question. The question whether um, certain properties are such that they are in some sense privileged natural properties. Nature is, as it were, already carved at those seams. Or, or whether you can't make that distinction. And that's the distinction that corresponds to the question whether natural kinds uh, are objective or whether the kinds of objects that we group things in terms of somehow reflect our interests and purposes. So uh, a very important point here is that you can make this distinction between the two things. The, the, this question about natural kinds is downstream from the question I'm asking. Because the first thing to say is, and I think this is part of, part of what um, also misled Goodman and Rorty, is that they ran these two things together. Um, the question of, regardless of whether you think these properties are natural or not natural or very bizarre or very relational and so forth and so on, is there a fact about how they're distributed across space-time, objectively speaking? Secondly, once you have that, you can ask about some of them, are some of them more natural than others so that certain groupings in terms of those natural properties like, for instance, everything made of zinc, as opposed to the group that consists of Francis and the Eiffel Tower and a piece of copper. Uh, you know, huh? Second, more Second one, more natural, is <laughs> the view you would expect in Paris, maybe. <laughs> but, uh, so th that's, that's a very important uh, distinction. Yeah. Um. So my question is, would it make any dif difference for you if I s uh, substituted for uh, Latour's uh, outrageous uh, statement about Ramses II another statement which would involve a kind of a, a different type of object, not a microbe, not a bacteria, but let's say if I were to say that you could find instances of cubism in certain medieval paintings or in split representation body painting in the Amerindian tribes, if I were to say this is an instance of cubism, would it make any difference in the way you react to the statement? Uh, yes. <laughs> so what difference exactly does it make? Well, you know, first of all, there is an interesting question about artist, artistic genre is, is, a, is a complex thing. And I, um, it's actually an interesting question whether you can imagine that, could you say, you know, they discovered cubism a long time before Picasso did. And actually, we pro probably can make some sense out of that. It's interesting, because it depends on what you load up into the notion of cubism. If it is something about perspective and, and representa fragmentation, representation, and so on, then you can think, oh, you know what, strange, strangely enough, there was a sort of strong cubist tradition in Africa before we... And of course, Picasso himself was influenced by African art. So... Um, No, but the point is, <laughs> it's not up to him to say that bacteria are like uh, artistic genres. Now, first of all, the, the, direct, the argument is going against 
this rather than for it, you understand? Because what we said about some, you might have thought, well, in the case of artistic genre, actually, it's very indexed to the time and the society in which it was created, so I can't think of it going backwards. But in fact, I'm, if we were finding that even in the case of an artistic genre, in that case, we can go backwards. So it's actually all cutting against Lato. You came up with the wrong thing. What you want is a case where, no, it would be absolutely absurd to say that, that you could read it backwards into a previous time and then say, well, maybe he's saying the same thing about bacteria. But the point is, even if I were to grant you the thing about cubism, which uh, you, you picked the bad example, maybe we can come up with a better one. You, it's not up to you whether bacteria behave that way or not. The whole point is that the, the nature of bacteria is precisely such as to have certain kinds of causal role in the causal network in a way that doesn't depend on its acknowledgement by artistic practices. I don't think that would be fruitful. Okay. No, my point is, you said yourself, it depends how you load the, the example, how you load it with content. But cubism, as you, as you, as you admitted, is, is also about certain objective properties of representation in space, perspective, and so on. And it's very much the same way. You could, say, you could argue that there is, of course, a basic core fact, scientific fact about, about bacteria. But that the fact of saying that admitting that these core facts are true of Ramses too has much less impact or con consequences um, um, or as, as, as little consequences as saying that, well, there is an element of cubism in for, you know, Fra Angelico or something. Look, like. I think that's what basically Latour is saying, and it's very innocuous. In and fact. Well, you know, this is the thing about sexy remarks is that you can, you can take them and then you can say, no, I meant something entirely benign. Like, for instance, um, we wouldn't really want to say that Ramses II died of consumption because consumption was a kind of metaphorical way in which people talked about tuberculosis when they didn't know its origin, and they were looking at the effects on the body, and it, of course, shows up in La Boheme, and so on. And so, you know, reading all of that back into Ramses II, yes. But if you want to say that, first of all, that's not worth writing an article about. Secondly, if you did, you could say it in a way that didn't get the headlines, okay? The headlines only come because you say, Saying he died of the bacillus, which has no real existence before 1882, um, it would be as anachronistic as saying that he died of machine gun fire. This is not a good way to describe the innocuous thing that you wanted to say. Uh, just very quick and, and general question. Um, uh, you, you mentioned in the, in the beginning of your talk here. Sorry. Oh, there you are. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned in the beginning of your talk that you think that this return to, uh, you know, this effort toward realism or to, to seeing reality independent of us is a good thing. Um, and uh, I, w I was just uh, wondering, I, I agree with you that it's a good thing, but I was wondering why you think it's a good thing. Uh, it seems to me to be a, a continuation of a project that was going on for a few centuries before the linguistic turn and before, you know, the turn toward phenomenology and uh, and it's uh, it, and we're returning to sort of like picking that project up now. And I was just wondering uh, why you think it's a good thing, and whether you have some kind of theory of why it's happening now, of why this is it, is it because maybe people are exhausted of analytic philosophy or or something well, like analytic that. Analytic philosophy. No, there 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 are many false presuppositions in <laughs> what you said. But okay. actually, one of the things, look, I, 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 I want to say, I want to pick up on, on the, the way you framed that thing, which I think is the most significant thing of all. Because, and it, you know, this was Rorty's view, too, about, I mean, if, if you don't believe that inquiry is about finding out how things are anyway and lining up your beliefs with how things are anyway, what do you think inquiry is? Well, he would say, you know, it's a conversation. As you say, it's a project. There's a kind of project, a continuing conversation. What is this conversation about? I mean, and what are we trying to do? You know, what uh, the, the, that pragmatist view of this just being a conversation, a language game, 
you know, doesn't make any sense unless there is a goal. And the goal has to be to figure out how things are. I don't think, I can't think of any other way of thinking what the goal of any inquiry is, in, including philosophy. And so when you ask me, why do you, why do you think it's a good thing? You see, when you think of it in these conversational things, you expect a kind of political answer, a kind of sociological answer. You know, we get tired of this other thing, so we decided to talk about this thing. Or, you know, actually, it turns out the scientists gave us a lot of money to say this, so we did this. You see, these are all cynical, extra-intellectual explanations for why people say things, when what you'd like to believe is that they say things because they find them to be true and because they've been able to untie the knots in the understanding that prevented them from seeing it or misled them into saying something else, and they're finally liberated enough to be able to say it. So, I, I, you know, the very framing of that was, is very interesting to me because it, it, it presupposes that all of this is a kind of wheel turning idly and all we have to do is figure out what the next fashion will be. Yeah. Two questions there. Okay, um, two more questions here. Um, Do you defend uh, a, a, a fact realism? Uh, I wonder. And uh, two questions connected with that. Uh, do you prefer a, a fact realism or property realism? And how do you define in uh, facts? Because uh, when I, I was listening at your talk, I was very much interested, but I, I had that problem. I'm sorry, I did try to say something about that right at the beginning, which was that I'm just tr trying as neutrally as possible to think of a fact yes. as the instantiation of a property by an object. So just, you know, a fact. So the fact that this coin is round is the instantiation of the property of roundness by this object. And if you want, you know, in order to be as neutral as possible, you can in fact think that the objects are not already individuated into coins and other nice shapes that we recognize, but just talk about the space-time manifold and as it were the distribution of properties on that space-time manifold. So facts are just how are properties distributed across space and time? That's what a fact is. And a prop property realism, well, that's just that's the old medieval issue about whether properties are abstract objects that also exist independently of the, the, of the names with which we, the so-called nominalism realism issue as opposed to the realism, anti-realism issue about facts. Yes, yes. No, that's a whole other issue that I haven't had. Thank you for your question. Yes, uh, you, I was going to ask a similar question about the fact, but you seem also to take the concept of space-time mm. as a granted concept. And when you say that the universe is 14 billion years old, this fact is meaningless apart from human clocks. Okay, so I think so in a way there is a lot of elements of that type. I would could similarly defend Bruni along the line. Uh, Ellie defended him that it's true that his statement was loose, but what he had in mind was that type of constructivism. So I think when people say somehow that 14 billion years old is a fact which is independent of constructivism, that's just not true. The concept of space-time is a concept. I, Einstein very well realized that. He said that we just forget that as a concept because well, he used it so time, so much. Yeah. Incidentally, Riemann didn't didn't invent non-Euclidean geometry. Well, and if I can ju just add one thing, is uh, coming back to the cubism. Uh, we all know the story uh, with this Watanabe trained these pigeons to uh, distinguish cubist and impressionist paintings. So did, were they really capable of telling those two apart? You, you tell me. Um, OK, well, those are two different things. Um, the, the, the time is, the, to me, <laughs> the most mysterious thing in the world, and especially on its relativistic, general relativistic views, we really don't, I don't understand exactly how to think about 
space time in the way that we're supposed to get from this, the, the, the special and general theories. So I don't want to make um, I don't want to make a special issue out of that. You're absolutely right that I'm helping myself to some idea of a distribution of properties over something. Okay, um, but um, the idea. I, I, d I don't know what sense you could make of the idea that the, obviously we have this sort of relativistic view of time given to us by relativity theory, which says you can't ask about duration independently of a frame of reference, okay. But that is a very far cry from saying that we create the facts about time. I mean, that would just be a very, a very difficult thing to understand, uh, especially since you'd have to explain how we created the past that we did not uh, exist in. So um, I want to bracket aside issues about time just because I think they're, ext they're extremely difficult on their own. So you're absolutely right that I am helping myself to some idea of a distribution across something. As for the, the question about cubism, <laughs> look, I, you know, I don't know if they're, look, the, um, the question, you get to decide which question you're asking. There is no, you, you're absolutely right in the following fundamental sense. You can get to say, look, I'm going to use this form of words, but I'm going to explain express a very specific question by it, okay? So for instance, when I use the word cubism, I am going to mean something that is not especially social, but has to do with geometry and has to do with representation, okay? Um, and then I'm going to ask, well, could ideas about depiction that involved those geometric elements, let's suppose, have shown up somewhere else in the universe independently of Picasso? The answer to that is, you see, whatever it might be, I'll, let's say yes, but, but that's only because what we've got hold of is precisely ideas of properties and ideas of instantiations of those properties that don't depend on our being willing to say certain things. Um, and so you can imagine them showing up somewhere else. If you load it up in such a way, just to give an example, um, I mean, what would be an example of something that you already know analytically could not have cropped up earlier? Um, social insurance for, for Ramses II, for example. Social insurance, no, I mean, even that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he was the he was the pharaoh, so he probably didn't need social insurance. Have, uh, just a, a short uh, yes. uh, suggestion for uh, the case of Ramos II. It is uh, if uh, uh, TB was invented by Koch, as uh, at the very end of his article suggests Latour, then. Uh, medicine would be the most dangerous of human activities. <laughs> this is, there is something very counterintuitive in this point. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.